Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Now, Peter, you're one of the few people who've seen Roads to Freedom since it last aired on television. For viewers who aren't familiar with it at all, can you explain a bit about the show, what it's about, and kind of why it's so important? Well, it's a marvellous, crisp, uh, concise dramatisation of Jean-Paul Sartre's enormous trilogy, The Roads to Freedom, which, uh, which covered the, the last months of peace uh, set in Left Bank Paris and is full of all kinds of extraordinary events and, uh, and philosophical discussions about human freedom. You wouldn't have thought it was, uh, it was filmable, but it was brilliantly filmed. One of the first things the BBC ever filmed in colour, in that rather nice artistic greenish colour they used to do things in back in the 60s. And it aired in 1970, just at the very end of the 60s, as they were slipping forever uh, away from us. And I, I and a huge number of other people watched it completely enthralled. And it left a great impression on my mind, not least the, the, the actual the theme music, the, the song which was sung at the opening and the closing of each, uh, of each episode, uh, the uh, La Rite Dura, by, sung by Georgia Brown. And many years later, thinking that it might be interesting to see it again, when a lot of old TV programmes are re-emerging, uh, I, I made some inquiries and found this extraordinary story about it. It, it does exist but it can't be shown. It was shown once to an audience at the British Film Institute uh, about 10 years ago, uh, over a weekend, but it's, it can't apparently be shown on television. The BBC are terribly evasive if you ask them why not, and they say they have no plans to show it. But we know it exists, and there it is. So I, I, having written a bit about this mystery in my Mail on Sunday column, uh, I was invited through a series of secret meetings and passwords and speakeasy arrangements to actually see it, and so eventually did. Uh, and it is, as, as I thought it would be, the most extraordinary evocation of the last years of the 1960s and also a very satisfying piece of drama. It's a great shame it can't be shown, but I, I think I can see why. Mm, I mean, some of our viewers might be asking fairly, you know, the BBC has thousands of shows in its archive, you know, it can't show all of them. Is it, is it just a procedural cost kind of thing why it can't be shown, do you think, or do you think there's something more going on there? Well, I think there's something more going on. I, I can't prove it, but I think there's a very interesting thing. There's a huge difference between what the radical left was like in 1970 and what it's like now. And there's a particular character, uh, Daniel, played by the fantastic actor Daniel Massey, uh, who is a homosexual character, and he's portrayed very much as he is in, in, in Sartre's book uh, as, a, as, a, as a man who, who strongly dislikes himself and a lot of what he does. Uh, and also has a rather ambivalent feelings when the Nazis eventually arrive in Paris, which are not really greatly to his credit. And I think that the BBC probably fear that if they showed this, that a lot of people would think that it was, it, it was saying something that it wasn't saying. Look, we all, nobody speaks about these things as they spoke about them in 1970 anyway. Uh, but there was something about that character who's immensely important in, in, in the whole series, which I think they think would bring them trouble from, from, from modern radicals. And so a very radical program now can't be shown, I think, because of the fear of what modern radicals would make of it. Great pity. It is a great watch. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned in your piece that sort of attitudes have changed around sort of sexism and abortion and, and various other things like that. Do you think that's why it makes such it might make such uncomfortable viewing for sort of it's, the BBC? It's, it's, it's mainly the, character, the homosexual character, Daniel. It, 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 is, it is mainly him. As I say, he's, he's, he's very important in the book and, and he made even more important. Daniel Massey steals the show in some ways uh, and it, 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 on, on many occasions sort of acts uh, the, 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 the titular star, Michael Bryant, off the screen. And, and you couldn't cut it out now. But if you left it in, I, I can just see the sort of people who like making trouble about that sort of thing making trouble. It, people have to understand that the left back in 1970, the 1960s left, was, was mainly a, still a, very much more a communist than a Marxist sort of left, of, of, of the kind that Sartre understood. It didn't have the same sexually revolutionary positions that it has now. Uh, female comrades were still expected to make the tea and sandwiches for the demonstrations and so forth, and everything that went with that for instance, and attitudes towards homosexuals and other minorities were still, I think, pretty suffused with the, with the, the prejudices of the sort of, sort of society it was then. And this wouldn't translate well into, the, into this decade. 
Do you still, still think the show has sort of value today, though, for us, then, if it is sort of very, very different times? I, I think so. I think, I'd say, the, the, the books, I, I, I greatly appreciated the books. I hear this is, this is an actual souvenir from the 1960s. This is, I, I see from the flyleaf that I gave it to myself on my birthday in 1968, five shillings, which some idiot will translate as 25p. It's a wholly different currency in a wholly different world. And the 1960s are, a, are an era which people find increasingly difficult to imagine if they weren't in them. Even I, who was in them, have difficulty in believing a lot of what took place. Part of the reason I wanted to watch the series was, was to see how, how my memory actually fitted with, with reality. And it is in, it's, it's extraordinarily evocative, not least because it contains so much brilliant acting talent. And of course, it's like so many things in the 60s, it's a wonderful film of Romeo and Juliet, which has the same atmosphere. You feel very strongly that this is at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the old culture, when people were still making things, who, who understood about Shakespeare and, and, and the classics in a way they no longer do. It has a very strong quality of having been made by highly educated uh, people of the kind who almost entirely disappeared from among us. It's, it's very nostalgic and, and rather moving from that point of view. And I say I wish that other people could see it, but I can't, I can't arrange for that to happen. You mentioned in your piece it sort of breaks with the puritanical morality of the day. Do you think it could have the same impact today, or do you think it's more of an interest to sort of as, a, as an insight into the decade of the 60s, more in that way? Well, no, it has a reverse impact, because it's quite obvious that the, 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 the Sartre character, Mathieu Delarue, is, is, quite, is quite squeamish about the possibility of, of, of obtaining the abortion. He spends most of the first few episodes trying to get for his mistress. He recognises that it's an act of destruction. Well, these days, of course, abortion on the left is a sort of sacrament and a, a woman's right to choose and all the rest of it. I'm not sure that would go down very well either. Uh, the, the, the position of the women in, in, in the drama is also one which I, I think a lot of modern feminists would find, would find made them rather uncomfortable. The references to drugs are pretty pejorative as well. Uh, the Lola Montero, the, the, the chanteuse, who is a, a major character and sings La Rite Dura, is ruining her life with cocaine, quite evidently, and there's, there's not much scruple made about that. And you mentioned in the beginning there that you, um, you did manage to see a screening through sort of various clandestine methods. Um, can you tell us a bit about that, or, or you can tell us about that? Nothing at all. No, my, my, my lips are wholly sealed. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm sworn to, I can't reveal anything about it at all. You weren't snuck into the BBC headquarters in a, in a diplomatic bag kind of thing. <laughs> well, you, can't, you can't tempt me. I, I'm just not going to tell you. <laughs> Fair I, enough. I'd be wrong, I, wrong I, not I, to I, ask. I had an <laughs> enormous good fortune in, 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 in seeing it, but I, I, I wish I could share it with other people, but I can't. And do you have any hope maybe, that it will maybe, be shared? Maybe if you make enough a noise about it, someone will approach you on a, on a street corner one evening <laughs> and say, Psst. <laughs> I have here a copy of The Rose to Freedom, you want to watch it, but maybe they won't. Do you, I mean, do you have any hope at all that it will ever be released, or is that a, a bit of a pipe dream at this stage? I think that, I, I, the problem is that although I think that the objections to showing it are stupid, uh, they are, they are, they're also wise, because the, 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 you can see why somebody would say, I don't really want to wish, I don't really want to risk the, 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 the possible fuss that would be made about showing this uh, by people who don't understand it and don't want to understand it and just want to make a fuss. There are, I think, a lot of people who will travel a long way in modern society to be offended by something. And this would give those people such an opportunity. And you can see why people sitting down in the committee, if they've got the freedom to say, and they have the freedom, of course, uh, to say that they won't screen it, then the, the chances are they'll take the easy option and, and leave it in the archive. Leads me to the next question, which is, you know, do you think anything like it could be made today? Not a chance. I, the, the, the people don't exist, the, the, the sort of talent, as I say, the, the level of education and understanding of classical training uh, that went into it, uh, the, and, and also the, the audience that it was aimed at, who, who were also considered to be uh, educated and informed in a way that audiences aren't these days, uh, don't exist. It's, it's a relic of, a, of another era. That's another reason why it's so moving to watch it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, before you go, we've spent the day at The Spectator trying to track down even just a clip of this television show. We even contacted the director's family, but to no avail. But we have managed to get hold of, which is available online, the show's title track and music, which was composed by the director himself. So we're just going to play that now for you. La route est due.
もない。